Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Eric Holm, Carmine Bailey, and Vince Power. Coming up on DTNS, Tim Stevens is here to explain why the Unreal Engine is in the new Mustang. Plus, is it the end for auto shows? And why the Matter standard is, is just it's kind of disappointing. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, September 16th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From upstate New York, I'm Tim Stevens. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chen. Tim, uh, thank you for joining us today. It's good to have you, man. I'm, I'm really glad to be here. Well, I'm glad to have you alongside. Sarah Lane's out today. She'll be back on Monday. But let's start with a few tech things you should know. Uber discovered a security breach Thursday and has taken several of its internal communications and engineering systems offline. It's investigating the incident along with law enforcement. I'd like to say no customer information was affected. There's no evidence of that yet, but their investigation isn't done. An individual told the New York Times they breached Uber by using WhatsApp to contact an employee and convince that employee to log into a fake Uber site which then used the entered credentials to log in immediately to the genuine Uber portal. The employee in question apparently authorized MFA. So when they logged into the fake site, the MFA got pushed. Whether they authorized it right away or they got tired of it uh, alerting them, it depends on who you ask. But, but they allowed the person in. So there was a second factor, but they socially engineered around it. Once in, the attacker found PowerShell scripts that an admin had created to automate logging into various sensitive network enclaves and used those to access multiple production systems, Slack management, Uber's endpoint detection and response portal, among others. The attacker may also have accessed Uber's AWS and Google Cloud accounts, as well as its bug bounty program which has since been disabled. Intel first released its Pentium chips in 1993 and the Celeron brand in 1998. Chips under those brands will still show up on low-end laptops, often in models of Chromebook. Intel announced it's replacing the Pentium and the Celeron brands, or maybe more accurately, it is deleting them. Processors that used to carry the name will now just be called Intel processors, starting with the 2023 notebook product stack. For now, Intel will continue to use the Core, Evo, and VPro brands for its own processors. Hey, that's, that's so silly. Calling your chip just Intel processor, that's like calling a, a <laughs> daily tech news show daily tech mm, news Truth show. in advertising, right? Yeah. Uh, Apple warns that there's an activation issue in iOS 16.0 that could prevent iMessage and FaceTime from working properly on new phones, uh, like, you know, the brand new iPhone 14. Uh, Apple has patched the problem in iOS 16.0.1. A lot of folks are getting their new iPhones today, though. So if the new phone prompts you to install the new version 16.0.1 during setup, you'll probably be fine. Uh, if it doesn't, go update it right away. If you're still having problems, Apple has posted steps to take if the problem persists after installing the patch. Security company Vectra identified a risk in the way Microsoft Teams on the desktop stores authentication tokens. Apps built on the Electron framework for Windows, Mac, and Linux store the tokens unencrypted. That means if an attacker gets access to your network, it could use the credential to impersonate you on apps associated with Teams like Outlook, and Skype, two which are pretty common apps used for some pretty important business stuff. Uh, Microsoft said that it will consider addressing it in a future update as it would require a much bigger breach, i.e. network access, in order to be exploited. In other words, if you have a network breach, you probably got some bigger problems to worry about. Yeah, I'd still like them to patch it. <laughs> I would too. And promise to patch too. it. Yeah. I get what they're saying, though. Uh, U.S. Senator Ron Wyden is raising the alarm again on the latitude that U.S. Custom and Border Protection agents have to access U.S. citizens' devices at the border. Not, I mean, if you're not a U.S. citizen, they can do whatever you they want, uh, but they can kind of do whatever they want with U.S. citizens' devices as well. Border authorities are not required by law to get a warrant in order to access the content of any electronic device. The Washington Post reports that in a briefing with U.S. Congress, CBP said its officials access around 10,000 devices a year, which is a low percentage of the number of people crossing the border, to, to be honest, but it's a lot of devices. Uh, and they add data from those devices to a database 
2,700 CBP officers have access to that database. Current rules require a border agent to have at least a reasonable suspicion that a traveler is breaking a law or a threat to national security in order to copy data over to that database. I cross the border a lot. I'm lucky to say that's never happened to me, but I do always make sure that all my devices have some charge because I know that if they don't turn on, that can cause some problems for you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, if you're not subscribed to Stacy Higginbotham's Stacy on IoT, uh, and you care at all about smart home stuff, go now. Subscribe. Uh, Stacy on IoT.com. Her latest newsletter is called Five Ways Matter Will Disappoint Users at Launch. It's an excellent piece because it sets you up to understand that the promise of matter is not lost just because it's not all there at the beginning. Uh, she explains what will and will not be there. If you read it, you can get ahead of most of the complaints people are going to have after Matter launches. A lot of people are going to be lobbing softball bombs at this thing. The short version, though, is that the Connectivity Standards Alliance is trying to trying not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. And they're going to push out a 1.0 version of the standard that's more limited than what the promise of matter has been up until now. Here's, here's the short version of what Stacy says. Uh, you're going to be able to turn light bulbs and smart plugs on and off real easy. That's going to work great. Everything else is where the problem comes in. First of all, some stuff is not included until a later version of matter. So video cameras, appliances, video doorbells, vacuums, robot vacuums. None of that stuff is going to be in version 1.0. Uh, that is not going to be part of matter. And of the stuff that will be included, your, your smart plugs and, and your, your light bulbs and such, matter is not going to support all the advanced features. Uh, so if you have a smart plug that does electricity monitoring, that's not going to be supported by matter. If you have a, some, uh, sophisticated recipes for mixing and matching, you know, the garage door goes up when you come home and then the lights go on inside, that stuff's probably not going to work. Uh, multiple brands of devices in a complex routine, probably not going to work. You're going to need an app a lot of the time. In fact, you're probably going to need the devices app for installation at this point, too. And while you technically will be able to use Matter on Google, Amazon, Apple, or Samsung hubs, the features that will work across those platforms are going to be limited. If you want those platforms more advanced features, you're going to still need compatibility and stay all in the same universe for a while. Adding a light bulb or two should work great. But if you add a lot of them, you may also hit a limit uh, of what it can handle. Now, None of these are permanent. This is not the way Matter is designed to work. Matter is going to update to solve these problems over time. It's just going to be limited when it launches. It's capable of doing more. It just needs time. Uh, as an educated consumer, I know you and I out there understand that standards evolve. USB is more capable now than it was when it launched in 2001. So it doesn't surprise me that Matter is going to be the same. But not all consumers are going to think that way. Uh, Tim, what do you think? Uh, can Matter survive what looks like might be a disappointing launch? Yeah, I definitely think it can. Um, I, I've actually worked on a few standards bodies over the years back in my software days, and I know that it's really difficult to get these things moving at all. And uh, so I do think it's important for them to get something to market and then to continue to evolve with the market, because otherwise they run the risk of having the market kind of just continue to run away without them. Um, frankly, I, I think that Matter doesn't really have the, the kind of awareness within the general consumer base at this point that's going to disappoint that many people. Certainly for folks like us, we're going to be a little bit disappointed that it's not going to be amazing out of the box. Um, but I think, you know, as long as expectations are being set and as long as they can continue to evolve and so that Amazon and Zigbee and everybody else are, are engaged in, in developing the standard, then, then yeah, I think this is a good thing. But but absolutely, um, Stacey's piece is, is really fantastic. Everyone should read it if you're interested in this. And frankly, I think they should print this out and put it in the box of every matter of <laughs> device uh, because I think people should, should definitely have their expectations in the right place. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a great idea. And it's a great point that uh, there's going to be a lot of loud talk in a small area about mm -hmm. the disappointment of matter. Uh, but the fact is that a lot of folks out there aren't going to realize what it is. I, I think the only danger they run is if people see the Matter logo on a box and someone explains to them like, oh, yeah, Matter, that means it'll it'll run on anything. It'll all interoperate. And then they get it home and they have a problem and it won't do a thing that they want. They may not trust that in the future as it does get better. Um, but I, I'm with you. I, I don't think that's going to be fatal to it. I think you're going to have a, a lot of people writing very long Reddit threads about how disappointed they are <laughs> uh, with matter. And that might be the worst fallout.
Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, apps will be updated. I have smart devices that their apps haven't been updated in years. So I'm not surprised, too, that it's going to take a while for, for everything to proliferate. Yeah, uh, it, it may take a while. I, that may be the biggest downside is I want it now. And it really yeah. may not. It may be five or more years uh, before it really gets to the point where it delivers on all of its promises. Nick with a C in our chat room is pointing out Wi-Fi A sucked at launch. No one ever remembers Wi-Fi A. Everyone remembers 802.11B, not 802.11A, because 802.11A didn't work. Well. <laughs> so yeah, this is not this is not new. Uh, this is new, and I don't think it's as bad as it sounds. But Thursday, Amazon announced a new feature for its smart devices called Customers Ask Alexa, where you can uh, have brands answer your questions. That might sound bad. Like if I ask how to get a pet stain out, is it just going to be the Bissell vacuum manufacturer telling me use the Bissell vacuum manufacturer? Uh, it's not unlike crowdsourced answers that Amazon has provided since 2018. Uh, if you don't know, there's something called Alexa Answers. And in that one, users of Amazon add answers to other users' questions. It's crowdsourced. In this new customers ask election version, it's the brands themselves providing the answers. It's just a special way for brands to be able to see questions related to their products and offer answers. Brands that register with Amazon Brand Registry can see frequently asked customer questions and then provide answers. Brand answers still go through content moderation, just like any crowdsourced answer would, to make sure that they're viable answers that are useful. Uh, answers are also attributed to the brand, uh, and the brands are not paid for providing answers. This is merely a way for them to service the customers. It's not at this point a revenue generating thing for Amazon uh, or for the brands. Customers Ask Alexa will launch in October in a limited rollout. All eligible US brands will, will get support later next year, and then eventually it'll expand beyond that. Uh, users will see responses in the Amazon search bar starting later this year, and then it'll come to Echo devices by the middle of next year. So I my first reaction when I saw this, Tim, was like, oh, great, we're going to get a bunch of useless answers telling me to buy mm -hmm. a product. But it sounds like maybe it, will, maybe it won't work that way. Yeah, I think this could be helpful in the long run. You mentioned moderation. I'm glad that they're making that kind of front and center because when Alexa Answers launched, um, there were some definite breakdowns when it came down to moderation. There were a lot of very, very bogus answers that go through, and some of them were even dangerous. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm glad that'll be part of it. But uh, honestly, I mean, at this point, if you watch any given DIY program on PBS or whatever else, there are always products being injected into all those explanations of how to do anything. So I think people are pretty used to it at this point. It doesn't necessarily have to be a hostile thing. And from a brand standpoint, it actually could be really useful data for them to see what kind of questions and problems people are having. Uh, and I could even see this expanding into like a how to put together you, your new table kind of thing where you're getting guidance from from the manufacturer or something like that. So I think there are some interesting applications here. I'm glad that for now it's not a paid thing, but I will be shocked if within six months uh, Amazon doesn't flip the switch on that. Yeah. As it is set up right now, I will give them credit. Uh, this is the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. If Ikea wants to let me be talked through assembling the Billy bookshelves, uh, that's fantastic. That, that that could be amazing. Or or even with an Echo Show, you know, give me some mm -hmm. diagrams and help yeah. like that. Who is better able to tell you about their product than the maker of them? And they and and manufacturers benefit from helping you get the most out of their product. So they're invested in giving you good information. Uh, that said, Amazon is invested in selling you things. And yes, providing you great support through the Amazon Echo will probably have a halo effect of making you want to buy more things through Amazon. Uh, but Amazon would also like to sell you more things directly. And I, I, I can't imagine there won't be some change to this policy down the line that changes that. My only hope is that wouldn't devalue the answers. Is that if the answers stay quality, I'm even okay with some money changing hands. Uh, but it makes it harder for those answers to stay quality once the money starts flowing around. Yeah, at that point, it becomes whoever's got the deepest pockets will be providing the quote unquote right answers, uh, even if they're not the best ones. And and really, you know, you, you may roll your eyes at, at that out there. But if Amazon does that, then the Echo won't be as valuable and people won't want to buy the Echo. And thankfully, this is a competitive marketplace. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. There are other, you know, there's Google Home, there's there's Siri, uh, there's even uh, other, you know, Samsung, uh, Bixby uh, could could make a comeback if, if Amazon got really bad, right? So so there's pressure for them not to be bad, is what I'm saying. Does that mean there's still hope for Cortana? 
I don't think so. I feel, okay. feel like Microsoft turned a corner on Cortana, <laughs> and they're they're willing to sell you that to put in your product. So I guess in that respect, there might be more manufacturers take advantage of Cortana, but it feels more like it's an it's an enterprise service. I'm still sad about that at this point. Yeah, I know. I I, I had high hopes for Cortana as well. It it worked. It still does. Um, uh, folks, we would like to hear what you would like us to talk about on the show. I would say a majority of our, our top stories at the top of the show were from our subreddit today. So thanks to everybody out there who are submitting those stories. Uh, you can join them. Submit stories and vote at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. The Ford Mustang has been an automotive icon. Uh, it went into production in 1964, and uh, we are about to see, in fact, Tim just saw, the 2024 model uh, that is 60 years later. Uh, you got a chance to see that model. There's some interesting tech going on in the new Mustang. For instance... Why is it running the Unreal Engine, Tim? <laughs> uh, it's actually pretty interesting, the tech that they've built into the dashboard. There are two displays, a 13.3 and 12.2, if I remember correctly, inch displays that are kind of integrated within a, a unified bezel. Um, and in the middle display, kind of the infotainment display, which is tilted toward the driver that they kept saying is a fighter-influenced design, um, you can go through your vehicle settings and you get some visualizations that are a lot like you would get if you were going through Forza Motorsport or, or Gran Turismo seven, eight, nine, whatever, um, whatever you're adjusting suspension, brakes, engine performance, those components within the car are highlighted with the kind of a cool rake trace design. It looks really good, actually. Um, High-res gra graphics inside of the, the center console are pretty cool. And then also on the, the, the gauge cluster behind the steering wheel, they've actually recreated the Fox body Mustang gauge cluster in 3D. Uh, and you can project that onto the gauge cluster to make your fancy new Mustang look like a 1980s era Mustang. Uh, <laughs> and presumably, I would be shocked if they don't offer other gauge cluster packages uh, for purchase down the road. But right now, anyway, there's Fox body in there. So I think that's a pretty interesting application of, you know, this consumer grade technology, uh, gaming uh, software in, in a car. And it looks looks really, really good. I'm it's actually a compelling good pitch to, to say the setup screen from Forza, where you can pretend to own a race car can be in your actual car that is also kind of a race car. Yeah, absolutely. And it looks just as clean as it would on, on an Xbox or a PlayStation. Yeah. Uh, now, we talked recently on DTNS about uh, the desirability of physical switches versus touchscreen controls. Sounds like uh, some of those are going away. Yeah, uh, Ford is keeping some of the major controls with physical buttons and knobs. There is still a volume knob, for example, but the HVAC controls for so your temperature, uh, your your climate control modes, all those have now been absorbed up into the touchscreen. There's no way to get to them through buttons. Um, Ford said they did this to free up room in the center console. So there's a little cubby now below the display with wireless charging, which is nice. Um, but, uh, you know, if you want to adjust your heated seats, that kind of thing, you're going to have to go tapping through a couple of menus to do so. This is commonplace. This is what everybody's doing. Mm -hmm. um, I I still like buttons in a lot of places. And again, there are still a fair few buttons in the Mustang, but many fewer than there were in, in the sixth gen, in the last gen Mustang. Is there any voice control in this Mustang? Is it all console? There is a bit, yeah, but it's it's fairly uh, fairly straightforward. It's nothing really advanced, like a Google Assistant kind of thing, like uh, like Volvo has in their cars, for example. But you can do uh, navigation through voice and a few basic controls too. Now, I see you hearing us talk about the Unreal Engine in the dash. Says, when do I get to steer my car with a gamepad? Well, <laughs> you could park your car with a joystick. Apparently, why why does the parking brake, the handbrake, uh, look like a big joystick? You, well, so the handbrake is is inspired by drift culture, basically. Uh, and so what they wanted to do was to give the car a modern handbrake. And pretty much every handbrake on a modern car these days is digital. You push a button, you pull a little lever, and, and the computer says, okay, engage the parking brake. It's not like the old ones where you pulled up and it ratcheted into place and you pull the button. Um, and so Ford wanted to bring a modern parking brake to the Mustang, but they still wanted you to be able to pull the handbrake and get the car sideways if you wanted to. Uh, and so they created this thing that's basically like a joystick that's shaped like a drift style handbrake uh, when you go into race mode and you pull on that thing it locks the rear wheels and will kick the car sideways letting you slide it around and make big smoky burnouts basically so they they yeah they wanted to give you drift power um in a silly looking joystick on the center console basically is is what that is uh so i mean you tell me as someone who's covered cars for a long time uh -huh. how do they strike how do they how do they they uh 
adjust to that line of like this is an illegal thing uh, that that you can now do with this feature we it's have. actually very surprising to me that that they would put this this feature in this car that exists only for the purpose of getting the car sideways there's no other reason to have this um you you only you can option that into the car if you don't get it then you'll just get a button to engage the, the parking brake on a normal car or like you would on a normal car um, and so I was surprised. Yeah, there's really no legal way to use that. So it would only be really on a racetrack. But then again, the last generation Mustang had a line lock function, which is designed explicitly to help you do big smoky burnouts. Um, and that was in the last generation. So they do have a history of doing this kind yeah. of thing. Well, uh, when, when you take your, your new 2024 Mustang out on your private ranch uh, and do smoky burnouts, uh, let us know how it goes. Yeah. Uh, now, among all this tech, you, you have not mentioned that this is an EV because it's not. This is a gasoline-powered car. Right, and Why that's actually that? a, a little bit surprising. We had fully expected this to be at least a plug-in hybrid. Um, the, the rumor or word on the street was that it was going to be some evolution of the Explorer's uh, plug-in hybrid technology or something else that would basically turn it into an all-wheel drive car with an electric front axle and a traditional gasoline-powered rear axle, so a combination of gas power and battery power. Um, but just a, a few days before the, the unveiling, the, the word kind of broke that that was not going to be the case. And so what we actually have here is a, a pretty minor mechanical evolution of the old Mustang. Uh, Jim Farley, CEO of Ford, says they're doing this because they think that as everyone else goes to electrification, that the Mustang might be the only gas-powered sports car left in the market. Um, I think that's maybe being a bit optimistic for them either running into some unforeseen engineering challenges or more likely them simply de deciding that because they have the Mach-E Mustang, which is fully electric, that they've kind of got their green cred in on that side, so they don't really have to worry about that so much on the Mustang anymore. I, I don't know for sure, but uh, that's just me speculating. And the, the Mach-E is very different than the traditional Mustang, so maybe they don't want to have to try to compete and merge those two lines. Would that make yeah, sense? Yeah, it's entirely possible. There's still a lot of debate raging whether the Mach-E is an actual Mustang, and, yeah. and I, I don't think we really need to get into that. But yeah, <laughs> certainly the, the Mach-E is a crossover SUV versus the Mustang, which is a two-door sports coupe. So um, probably the more that they can keep them differentiated in the product portfolio, probably the better for them. And for Star Trek fans, we're saying Mach, M-A-C-H-E, not Mach-E, right. not the right. uh, rebellion in the Badlands. Absolutely. Uh, you saw the new Mustang as part of the North American International Auto Show, right? Yeah, which is uh, interesting because that show has been evolving a lot. The, the New York, or excuse me, the, the North American Auto Show used to be in January. It was right after CES. It was really struggling for years because CES was kind of uh, drinking its proverbial milkshake, as it were, with more and more auto companies choosing to go to Vegas instead of Detroit. Um, so it had been a few years. It moved to the summertime to avoid the kind of the CES bump. And then COVID happened, um, which was not great for the, the, the North American International Auto Show. So this is really the first big North American auto show we've had in a couple of years. And uh, it was not as big as it used to be. Uh, there was a lot of empty space on the show floor, which was kind of sad to see. And just a lot of manufacturers um, chose not to not to be there. It's, it's similar to what we've seen at CES and E3 in the past, um, but it was a pretty dramatic example of, of the, the shifting tides for the, the auto show right now. Uh, yeah, it, it is similar. Uh in that you see car companies doing their own announcements now, uh, the the way that Apple and Sony and Microsoft do their own announcements, Samsung, uh, it it has not led to the total demise of CES. It certainly has put E3 on the brink. Uh, yeah. We'll see if it makes it back. Uh, do you think this is it for auto shows? Are they irrelevant now? It, it, I wouldn't say they're irrelevant, but they're struggling. Auto shows traditionally have served three audiences, and, and those three have kind of been like the legs on a, a wooden stool. Uh, on one hand, there's the media. You know, we go there to see new car launches. Um, so car companies will unveil their new whatever at, at auto shows, and we'll write about it, and that's good for, for the industry. They also serve the consumers. Um, unlike your average uh, CES or E3, uh, auto shows are typically open to the public. So whoever wants to buy a new car can go to these auto shows and check those out too. And then uh, also they serve the industry. So if you want to partner with a new supplier for some sensory car, you go to an auto show and you sign that deal. Um, now, though, consumers are largely shopping and, and doing their research online, so they don't necessarily need to go to an auto show anymore. And because, like you mentioned, ma manufacturers are following the Apple Q and doing their own events off-site, um, that also diminishes the impact of these shows for the media. So that means that really they're only serving the industry, and the industry can just have those meetings on Zoom. Mm -hmm. So it is it is unfortunate, um, but the auto show's importance is, is waning for sure. You, you would think that the ability to get in a car <laughs> would would make it uh, more more resilient to that, but uh, it would be interesting to see. Yeah, pe people are, are showing a willingness to buy a car sight unseen, much more so than we've ever seen before. I, I bought a car in 2020 from Carvana that was delivered from Atlanta, Georgia, to my house. Uh, I never went to a dealer. Uh, so, there yeah. you go. Yeah.
On uh, Tuesday this week, L.A. police were called out to hi- a high school on what turned out to be a hoax. But while treating it seriously and investigating, they put up crime scene tape to deter bystanders. TV cameras had to stand on the other side of the crime tape, uh, so they weren't too po- close to any possible incident. Again, nothing happened. Uh, however, a serve robotics delivery robot, which makes deliveries for Uber Eats, rolled right on up to the crime scene tape. One of the camera operators standing there watched it hesitating and flashing red lights and eventually raised the tape for it. I think it took pity. He took pity on it and let the robot roll right on into the crime scene right past the cops going along its merry way. Uh <laughs> Autonomous robots are almost always supervised by humans. Uh, any of these these sidewalk robots usually have somebody overviewing them. They, they could overview multiple robots at once, uh, but the idea is to intervene if there is a problem. Serve has a policy that their robots should not cross police tape, uh, which is why the robot autonomously paused. However, a spokesperson for Serve Robotics told Gizmodo that the robot's human supervisor mistakenly thought it was being waved through and so gave the robot the go ahead. Uh, My guess is this is not what they've said, is that when that camera person uh, raised up the tape, uh, the supervisor, maybe they were distracted, maybe not, just looked at that and said, oh, I guess they're letting it through. Okay, great. Uh, and, and, And let it roll on through. So. So Tim, we were we were talking earlier. Usually, the debate on autonomous cars is about you know how they would deal with vague situations like this. In this case, it was the human that didn't deal very well with it. Yeah, this is very different than the typical trolley problem that we're always debating. Uh, this is a case, yeah, where the human operator clicked a button, said, "Yeah, go on ahead," and, and it went right through. But, but this really deals with with the the question of contextual cues, um, mm-hmm. which which human beings are very good at reading, and which robots are are really not so good. So, you know, we're talking about autonomous cars. How often have you been at an intersection waiting to turn? You see a pedestrian, you make eye contact with them. The pedestrian assumes that you see them, they go ahead. Or maybe you you, you know, use your hand to wave somebody to, to go through the intersection, that kind of thing. Robots can't do this, and they, they by default can't really understand what you mean. So that's why some some of the companies fall back to human operators. And when the human operator screws up, um, yeah, then things get uh, get get kind of comical and satirical. This reads like a kind of a jokey episode of Black Mirror to me, where like the <laughs> the, the delivery drone rolls through and and you know scoops up the, the murder weapon secretly and attaches it to the bottom and then continues rolling on with like uh, uh, tire tracks of blood behind it or something like that. Um, that's all I, I could picture in my head. Thankfully, uh, that's not what happened, thing. but I could absolutely see a Black Mirror episode <laughs> like that for sure. Uh, all right, let's check out the mailbag. Rick wrote us an email called "Does Tech Gatekeep Labels." Uh, Good morning, DTNS team. First, I'd like to say thank you for the concise and understandable proof of work explainer. It helped a lot on a topic I was peripherally knowledgeable on. Uh, Thank you, Rick. I'm glad you you appreciated that. Got got a lot of good feedback on that episode. Second, I finally started seeing articles comparing the Apple Watch Ultra to some of Garmin's offerings in earnest. Some of those reviews make some sort of remark that the Garmin isn't actually a true smartwatch, but rather a fitness tracker. I feel like this occasionally happens with developing tech segments. Do you think this is simply a result of a market leader establishing an ideal of what a product category is and that sticking, regardless of how muddied the waters get for a while, unconsciously or not? Is it a result of marketing? Is it even a bad thing? Uh, These are great questions, Rick. Tim, what do you think? Yeah, they are great questions. I remember when uh, the iPhone first dropped, there was debate about whether the iPhone was a smartphone because um, it couldn't do a lot of things that you could do on Windows Mobile or whatever. Um, but yeah, to me, it, it's ridiculous that because Garmin is a fitness-focused device, that therefore it isn't a quote-unquote smartphone. You know, you can do a lot of incredibly smart things on a modern uh, Garmin device. Um, so yeah, I think it's an interesting thing. But ultimately, I think it's up to the owners of these devices to to kind of tune that stuff out, frankly, you know, if the device does what you need it to do, if it's smart for you, if it's improving your quality of life, which Garmin devices would do for a lot of folks, um, then, then who cares what the label is personally? That's what I think. Yeah. I, I think what happens is the reviewers are trying to be fair. Uh, and so they may not mm-hmm. be trying to throw Garmin under the bus so much as saying, well, Garmin isn't meant to be a smartwatch. It is meant to focus on fitness, whereas the Apple is meant to be a full smartwatch. So there are things that the Garmin doesn't do because it never needed to do those to, to capture its market. I think that happens. Mm. So, and it's less gatekeeping and more like trying to say, well, the, these, are, these are coming from different areas. So Expectation setting, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Tim Stevens, thank you so much for for being with us today. Uh, I know you've got a new sub stack out there. I've been enjoying it quite a bit. Tell folks more about that. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm just kind of stretching my legs a little bit on the writing side and, and trying out some new things. So yeah, check out uh, my Substack, timstevens.substack.com, I'm talking about everything from uh, electric cars to management techniques and that kind of thing. And then uh, always on Twitter, Tim underscore Stevens. Um, you can find me there too. And uh, thanks to our brand new boss, Sergio. Just started backing us on Patreon. Uh, this could be you on Monday. Uh, but today it's Sergio. Sergio getting all the love uh, for backing us on Patreon. We're always very appreciative of our longstanding backers and our new backers alike. So thank you, Sergio, for being along for the ride. Welcome welcome to the club. Uh, and stick around, Sergio and all patrons, for the extended show Good Day Internet. We'll be talking more with Tim about stuff. Uh, you can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more about that, dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'll be back Monday with Lamar Wilson. Talk to you then. This week's episodes of Daily Tech News Show were created by the following people. Host, producer, and writer, Tom Merritt. Host, producer, and writer, Sarah Lane. Executive producer and booker, Roger Chang. Producer, writer, and host, Rich Straffolino. Video producer and Twitch producer, Joe Kuntz. Technical producer, Anthony Lemos. Spanish language host, writer, and producer, Dan Campos. News host, writer, and producer, Jen Cutter. Science correspondent, Dr. Nikki Ackerman. Social media producer and moderator, Zoe Detterding. Our mods, Beatmaster, W. Scott is one, Bio Cow, Captain Kipper, Steve Gautarama, Paul Reese, Matthew J. Stevens, a.k.a. Gadget Virtuoso, and J.D. Galloway. Mod and video hosting by Dan Christensen. Video feed by Sean Way. Music and art provided by Martin Bell, Dan Luters, Mustafa A., Acast, and Len Peralta. Acast ad support from Tatiana Matias. Patreon support from Dylan Harari. Our contributors this week included Terrence Gaines, Scott Johnson, Tim Stevens, and Chris Christensen. And our guest this week was Max Scoville. Thanks to all our patrons who make the show possible. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>